This is episode eight of Narrative Wake, and a show that's brought to you by esports pools. Now you might say to yourself, "What do I care about that? What's what's the big deal? You know, I only care about esports. Why would I care about fantasy esports? Why would I care about betting?" Well, you know what? New experiences are literally all life is about. All you can do is have new experiences. You can have new experiences that are the same experiences, but they're still new because they're an experience that hasn't happened before. So in some senses, trying different things, that's actually a way to add variety to your life because you will die. Everyone in this call will die. The whole human race will die. This is all mainstream science. The planet Earth eventually will die. The universe will die of heat death. And basically everything you know on an organic and spiritual level is probably done at that point in time. Or, listen, let's leave a bit of a you know, chance there. Maybe as Lord Vishnu sleeps in the cosmic ocean, the lotus of the universe grows from his navel, on it sitting a Brahma, the creator god, which opens its eyes. A world comes into being, perhaps our world, perhaps the future world. He closes his eyes, the world goes out of being. 432,000, I think it is, years pass. And all I'm saying is in that time, if you actually felt like betting on a team and you thought you knew who was going to win, I mean, it's not really going to be, not going to matter either way, is it? So it's up to you. Who you want. Right. So uh, listen, there's a reason why I don't need copy to do these commercials. And yet they, in some ways, uh, they're compelling somehow, right? It's almost because you keep listening, sort of going, how is this commercial? But then next thing you know, you've listened to it all, you know? So it's too late at that point in time. So this is episode eight, usual host, Dorian. Just leave it at that. Uh, usual <laughs> co-host, Kelsey Moser, who has put in a lot. Listen, I'm sick of people commenting on Kelsey's looks, okay? Because she puts in two to three hours of makeup, pedicures, <laughs> like she picks out her wardrobe, all just to make you bloody <laughs> misogynistic men feel good about yourselves while you watch the show and have a great entertainment experience. So maybe just, you know, be go easy. That's all I'm saying. Go easy. Show her a little bit of bloody respect. That's all I'm I just, saying. I just remember when I had an Ask FM, and one of the questions was, how do you get so ugly? And I went on this really, really long, detailed explanation about how you could actually systematically make yourself ugly. So I just assume that people think that this is now what I do every day. So I kind of appreciate that. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. So... Our guest for this episode is Veteran, who, if you actually remember, we had on a recent episode where it was the one where we were talking about EU LCS playoffs, obviously. And on this episode, the first hour or so was just like deep H2K talk, you know. And part of the reason why is because I did introduce Veteran, you know, not only did he spend a little bit of time briefly as a journalist, but then beyond that was an analyst for H2K. And what's great is I actually now remember that all I did is mention that you were with H2K. I actually never referenced that you work for Schalke as a coach in any context because all of us are trying to forget that veteran so that, you know I did, I, no one by the way no one brought it up no one said you didn't even say anything everyone just left it so along similar lines veteran is here to talk about the career of a player called ryu h2k player not shalka player you know it's h2k player so the reason why we're going to do this episode is because actually this is a concept that i had actually often wanted to do for summoning insight in fact, there was lots of content, sadly, I'll just go ahead and drop down completely on money here. There was lots of content, including, if you remember, I did open a fucking Hall of Fame, which we only did one episode for. Because unfortunately, a mixture of the fact that Monty did have to cast quite a lot when he was like the only set of casters for LCK, and the creation of LCK, meaning that like, you know, as they expanded the format, the amount of workload each week went up and up and up. And a little known fact is that people who are commentators, basically, if they're actually responsible, should only talk a certain amount of time per day, basically, because they can like blow their voices out and you don't have a lot of time for breaks. So sadly, I had all this idea for ideas for banging content. Then again, though, on the upside, it would have been on that shared channel, so Monty would have got half of it. But this way around, I mean, I get, oh, I still share half it with you. I guess that doesn't really work, actually. Never mind that, that doesn't work, actually. I, th I thought, sadly, you know, I don't just get it off myself. I'm not pulling an easy E here, just taking all the money from the group. But, now, we can do episodes that aren't just week by week or just like a current thing. We can do episodes that talk about anything. So I thought what we'd do is we'd do some episodes where we talk about some players that I think the obvious ones to start with are players where I feel like either very few people have actually watched their whole careers, you know, maybe they played in a bunch of different regions, or more importantly, they've had very varying different 
differences in success and therefore people go like one way or the other. Like, so for example, if you were to talk to someone about someone like Dandy, well, he's literally now played in three different regions. So you'd already be at the point where most people haven't watched his whole career. And then also half the people are going to just tell you about the guy who was the best in season four or half that watch now might be like, oh, maybe he wasn't as good in, in other areas. So along those lines, here's where I want to start. Okay. Because I feel like this is my, this is my temperature that I've taken of the community on Ryu over the years. Okay. So when he was in KT Bullets, and KTB, whatever they were called at the time. And they became a very good team. So they actually already had become a lot of pretty good before Insect joined. I think they'd already made the semis of that like OGM winter 2012. And then going in though, they obviously were Insect initially as their jungler and then made him top laner. And they gradually moved up the ranks so that they were an elite team all these seasons and then eventually became arguably the second best team in Korea for the last half of the year. At this point in time, yes, everyone acknowledged Ryu was a really good player. He was considered one of the best mid laners in the world. Obviously, he was literally a rival to Faker. Then you go to like season five, obviously, uh, season four rather, Katie Bullets obviously like had a big downfall. He eventually left. And if you remember, was actually playing in this really fucked scenario where he was going to join. He joined Millennium first and then they like didn't qualify yeah. for LCS. Then he would, then he stood in for like the Rockat team and just actually shit the bed and lost to CLG, which is obviously unforgivable. And, <laughs> and then he then went and was with, uh, well, then he could join H2K, right? So at that point in time, people. I remember was super down on him. They were like, well, he was bad in Korea and then he shit in the West. And in fact, he was kind of a poster boy for like the Koreans where it's like, don't just get a Korean because they're a big name, you know, it might not work. And people thought, you know, he comes to Europe where we've got a lot of good mids and he was nothing special. Then you go into the H2K era, the first H2K era, Obviously, that team didn't have a lot of talent in it. We're talking about the one with Lulex, etc. I mean, in theory, like their carry player was like fucking Hyanan. So you can already tell they weren't exactly like beast players. Oduam, they was still, uh, that was his first time in the LCS. So again, Ryu actually got some pretty good props here because the team kept making the semis, they qualified for Worlds. Then you come to season six, coming in on beyond that. H2K became one of the best teams in Europe. At this point in time, I know it's not as much focus was on him, but at the same time, interestingly, I feel like at that point, he became what I call royalty, right? And what I mean when I say the term royalty is, once you get enough of a rep and you've done well for long enough, you can get away with actually having bad or average games and people will never comment on it. They'll just wait until you have the good game and go, well, look at that guy, what a fucking legend. And I feel like that's where he was like season six. And then obviously we can get into where he is now. So I want to go back in time here, veteran. Do you remember the days when Ryu was on KT Bullets? Was it was in Korea? Uh, yes. Obviously, not to the same extent as I remember his entire European career. Like I sure. remember the Millennium and Rocket stuff also really distinctly, and I wrote a lot about him uh, when he was in season five. Okay. Uh, when it comes to KT Bullets, I remember most of the things everyone else remembers. I remember the I am. Uh, most of all, uh, yes. I remember. I mean, the season three, uh, season three summer was actually the first uh, season of OGN that I ever watched. Oh, okay. And the uh, big things that I remember coming out of KT back then was stuff like the Static Ship Tristana, like they were a very innovative team uh, back then. Uh, and, and I do remember Ryu as being like a good mid laner back then. Uh, he was essentially the same player when he uh, came over to Europe, uh, which I found rather interesting. And it's just the way that teams had to play around that, that change a lot, in my opinion. Okay, so what do you mean by that then? What, what, like, what do you think was different about how you have to play around him? Because obviously you have some kind of intimate knowledge sure. of him being the analyst. Okay, so uh, we had some. So we, I think, like Ryu in like summer of S five, as yeah. powerful as he was on H two K relative to the players on his team. Like when he was like the proper carry threat, and I think that he was en enabled a lot by Kasing's uh, tendency to overward literally everything. Initially, when we got the Yankos Vander roster, uh, Vander and Yankos weren't as strong on vision control as Kasing was alone, basically. And Ryu always needs like a side of the map that's basically lit with wards to pull off the assassin uh, type playstyle that he had in season three and carried over into Europe. Okay, so he relied much more on fake pressure rather than uh, rather than like pressuring his lane. Uh, through sheer laning prowess or something like that. So consequently, on H2K, he performed the best when both side lanes were winning. And in uh, 2016 H2K, so my H2K with Forgiven and Oda Wamne, he always had that. I feel like that Ryu, if Ryu had stayed, he wouldn't be able to do that with the new 
you clear Chaybot lane. And so I feel like that's a large amount of the reason why Ryu's on the huge downswing now in North America. I feel like that's why he was such an important part of the team in Season 5 and why 2016 HK functions so well with him. But it's okay. also a limitation in a way. Okay. See, that's actually interesting, Kelsey, because essentially... Like he's kind of, his, this is what this is actually essentially what he sort of done there is tried to resolve the entire riddle that I set where like people's expectations just went up and down depending on where his team's success was. And yet, if you notice, most people's way of solving that it's the way they always do it. It's just like, oh, he was just shit for these three months, and then for these three months he was really good, and then for these three months he was average, and then they kind of imagine if as if he was on the same team every time. Do you do you buy that from your perspective? Does that work? The idea that he was the same type of player. Uh, yeah, um, I actually agree with that. I kind of noticed it as well when H2K, especially particularly because H2K started playing towards sidelines a lot more. And when I went back and watched some of his, because I did watch him, I think I watched him the most in Korea in like 2013 spring. Um, so when I went back and watched, so this was even before Insect went top, right? Yes. But when I watched him a lot in 2013 spring, it was a meta where you could play like these towards sort of assassin picks. Um, that some of the assassin picks that were really popular were like Cossix or just picks that didn't necessarily straight up win lane. And then you could come and you could get, get a pick later on. And KT Bolts had really, really highly praised map play for map play, excuse me. <laughs> For that reason is because they were very good at, uh, even if they gave up pressure in the mid lane, they could find ways to get back into the game. They could set up like these sort of like two man Baron strategies where someone was split pushing bottom and then two other people were two manning Baron and things like this. Um, so I think that that's something that Ryu got really used to is just kind of playing towards side lane and playing like these matchups that weren't wouldn't necessarily smash the lane right away and then wait for an opportunity to get back into the game based on either vision control or pushing a sideline and he was always like kind of really in the already default going towards sideline uh, when mid game started so i think that the way that he describes it makes a lot of sense um i actually ended up asking him about it at rift rivals in terms of what happens when like when it seems like your team is winning and doing well around you versus what you do and then he kind of put it down to like individual motivation but i do think it has a lot to do with just like his natural play style of giving up mid to strengthen sidelines or just getting picks later okay so one thing that i think is interesting about that is that that's one of the things i always had a real problem with, with that katie bullets team was that like, it was very hard to tell who actually are, like, superstar players in this team. Because, first of all, they were so famous for, like, gimmick plays and just, like, making the one decisive map rotation, you know, that, that potentially can win you the game. They also had pretty good team fighting as well. But it did seem like it was, like, a tactical and team play element that made them a very good team. I, I think if you look at their careers, it's not many of them went on beyond that or, or, or after it that seemed like star players individually you know so obviously he was one of them at the time but then again as you kind of referenced this was also season three assassins <laughs> like almost every yeah. assassin you can think of was like unbelievably broken when they brought them in in that period in time but with the caveat that you have to be able to make it work so for example if you couldn't make zed work then no one would play it you know so and korea obviously is the ultimate like kind of testing point in that sense because something has to be viable they won't always just do it for a gimmick play so so here's the question then it, when you say that, like he needs the side lane pressure, what do you actually think he is like? Just as a, it, obviously you can't do this, but if you took mid lane as an island, what is he actually mm -hmm. like? Um, I actually I think that he's not like a super strong laner, but he's good at finding ways back in after he makes a mistake or after he gets pushed in. Uh, like there would be moments where he would get forced out of lane and he would come back with like a some kind of creative item or creative buy or he would just like f go around the lane and he would find a flank with the jungler um, to get 
to when the enemy mid laner was pushing out and then he would be able to get a pick there and get back into the lane from behind if he made a mistake so i think he was like kind of a creative laner but not necessarily like the one who understands the matchup or who mechanically outplays every matchup or anything uh, of that nature which is what like sure. when faker was coming up that was kind of like yes. the faker player who's understood what how much damage he could do uh what risks he could take like where he could punish you things like that so i think that that's kind of the difference that i would provide between the contrast i would set between ryu and someone like faker or how we think of really really powerful mid laners I think when you're describing somebody who's perfectly safe, I think you're describing more Odawamne, and that's the type of player that Ryu would absolutely want to play with. Uh, okay. Because for me, when Ryu was confident in, in his side lanes and in their ability uh, to actually win their lane, he was he was confident in his own play style. He wasn't like a 100% player all the time. Like in North America right now, he's only really showing spectacular showings on like just Corky, I think. Um, but when he had the security of both side lanes, that really helped with his mentality as well. So in a way, H2K keeping Oda Wamne was like a really, really good thing that they did. I know you pointed to Hianan earlier, I believe, as like he would have to be the carry player for H2K. But actually coming out of Challenger, Oda Wamne had been the most consistent player on that roster by a significant amount, especially in the promotion tournament. Uh, all four of them, I believe, HGK went through. They never even won any of them. But uh, Oda Wamne was consistently the top performer in all of those. Like people, people thought he was going to be CLG's next top laner. You know, it was between him and Zoro Zero at one point. Um, so keeping him, I think, was brilliant for HGK if they wanted to keep Ryu. And adding Forgiven just added uh, a for sure side lane. And now Ryu was going to have good performances all the time. I feel, I feel like that setup in that particular roster is why Ryu ended up uh, becoming such a solid player, as you would say. Okay, so when you eat, one of the other factors that people often credited to Ryu, which is obviously so tricky when you're adding this into like how good a player is, is the, is the consideration that they're in any way a shot caller. And because Katie Bullets was such a fantastically coordinated team who could pull off like pretty high risk but high reward moves in games, the, like people I remember famously thought Ryu was the main shot caller of that team. But I have to say, when you look back now, I, as far as I know, like Ryu, Maffa, and Score, who at the time was the bot lane and the mid lane, they'd actually always been in that team a long time, like a couple of years. So I feel like it's one of those teams where. I think it's the. I feel almost like it's the opposite of the Cloud Nine effect. So in Cloud Nine, we all thought everyone in the team was just really on the same page because they told us that basically. They, they tried to imply it was like Lemonation and Meteos and High, and you know, no, no, no one of them's the shot caller. But what you really found when he took the pieces apart and you let sort of the experiment play out is, well, no, it really was just High. Like he was doing it all, and then they did their own little bit, but on their own, they were. He was the engine of the team in that sense. I have to say, looking back now, when you consider. Ryu doesn't look that different when he plays in teams where he's speaking only in English. I've got a question for you that goes like this, right? So I remember, I think it was Yankos actually like credited Ryu and said like, you know, when he does shot calls, they are like very decisive, you know. But even when he said that, he made it sound like his shot call would be like, go top now. You know, like it wasn't anything in yeah. depth. And I have to say, people have always claimed from H2K that Ryu speaks really good English, right? I have met the guy, bullshit. He might be able to understand <laughs> English, and he might every now and then say a funny half a sentence. This guy could not like ha hold a long conversation and say all really abstract topics. So how does that play into the shot calling element? Like, what? How yeah. much in, in a team like HK does he shot call, do you think? Okay, as, as true as that is, that he's definitely not the type to hold a very eloquent conversation in the manner that we're doing right now. Uh, an eloquent conversation, the manner we're doing right now, would be terrible shot calling. So thank sure. God Ryu has to be brief with the things that he says. In terms of him being like the main shot call of the team or anything like that, uh, he would make those types of decisive calls, but only when he was ahead on a champion like LeBlanc or like Fizz or an assassin okay. like this, where he had a very good idea of like his threat potential at certain points in the game and, and how to and how to best enable that. And he would he would make the decisive calls then, but otherwise I felt like it was much more Odawamne and Yanko's uh, shot calling for the team. There wasn't really like a main shot caller, so to speak. There are very few okay. teams, by the way, that actually have a main shot caller. It's actually sure. a deficiency if you end up with a main shot caller on your team. That's not a good model. I know it's preached a lot, and a lot of teams try to find their main shot caller. I wouldn't even say it's like democratic shot calling that you need. You just you need a stream of information, you need a decisive call on certain objectives. So like Yankos was the one who was always supposed to be our guy for Baron, for example. Odawamne should always needed to let us know when his uh, TP was available, and when he was on Champions like Kennen, he was very good at knowing 
when he should fight, like when we should actually do a team fight, when he was in the best position to engage one. So I, I wouldn't say it was democratic either. I wouldn't say it was all Ryu, but when Ryu was on a champion like LeBlanc or Fizz and he, and he was a really good thing to play around, he would be decisive. So, okay, a, t- a question that I think ties into this, this is a question for you, Kelsey, okay. is I also do feel like there were kind of like two Ryus. Like, he definitely had his comfort champions where he would make, he was, clearly could make plays all over the map, and he actually had a good sense of what he could do at all times on the map. But I always felt like, for me, his main deficiency was when he was on, like, the other champions that were in the meta and he just played them, I almost felt like it's not that he misplayed, he just sort of was a non-entity. He just didn't really do anything, it felt like, you know. I think he had a certain way of approaching the game that was a lot about, um, okay, what am I going to do in a team fight or what am I going to do approaching this area? And he thought about champions, almost like all of the champions he was good at, like assassins, you know? Uh, I'm going to have this particular angle of approach. And it was most telling to me when I was watching like this uh, series between MVP Ozone and KTB in spring, and he was playing like Karthus in side lane, and he was almost like when the key to eventually Ozone won this game by realizing that if they burned Ryu's flash, he wouldn't really know how to be effective. Like he wouldn't necessarily be able to use like the cues effectively or anything like this. He's his way of playing it was to flash into the team fight effectively. And um, I think that that's that was something that was kind of um, humorous to sort of watch in the context of Ryu because it's like, yeah, I feel like he still thinks about champions this way. Um, Oriana, I think, was similar where the ball was kind of it was almost like toys was really credited with playing Oriana like an assassin. Yeah. I feel like Ryu thought about Oriana in, in a similar way. So, I mean, he was that was one thing in his KT Bullets days. He was very famous for. He was like one of the best I've ever seen at like just using the threat of the Oriana ball. Basically, not not even like it's not like he landed all these sick ultimates. Like, and Faker did it. He would always just do like a fucking reaction play, you know, and try and just mm-hmm. land it like the second he saw an opening. But like in almost every time I've ever seen Ryu use Oriana, he always did just like try to sort of like zone people out of an area with it. That's all he was using it for. Come on, veteran. You're now going to say every good mid laner does that in Europe 10 years later, aren't you? Come on. I mean, I want to agree with her that you should credit Toys with thinking about that. But the first time that uh, Ryu came to Europe, I'd, everybody and their moms were telling me this about his Oriana. And I was a bit sad. They're like, OK. And then I watched him bring out the Oriana in the Rockat series. And I know you watched uh, oh, yeah. the Rockat series at IAM. And he was like, two, he was just hitting like two man ults every now and again when no one's in yeah. a position to follow up and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure if this is the same Ryu people are talking about. So I think this this aspect of his Oriana sure. is being a bit played up. His patience of it, at least. On the topic of him and like well, uh, let more me just meta mages. What, what yeah, I would sure. say on that, okay, the logical, again, that to me is where I, I kind of just track that back and say, that's also where I wonder how much of the shot calling was him and the other team. That sounds yeah. like he just did that knowing, for example, like, for example, Score was a very safe AD carry. Mm-hmm. So like maybe the logic there is like he's, he's specifically doing something in conjunction with a teammate, which you're obviously not doing when you're just playing with, well, first of all, Rock at bunch of fucking Polish players and then and half of them by the way spoke barely in English and then obviously later H2K is just a complete mix of players of styles and backgrounds and so I, I, I would agree like it did seem like that unraveled some of the myth in that sense. Sure in the Azir Victor meta he was also rather resistant to like playing those types of champions a lot like this was that this is a deficiency that you're successfully pointing out his champ pool was still majority assassins uh, it was basically similar to like new duck and incarnations champion pool back in sure. the day he basically carried that and that it's a very season three season four champion pool that he's continued to play obviously not late season four where everything was about wave clearing of zigs and stuff he wouldn't have succeeded in the meta like that and he I wasn't think, succeeding in the meta like that i think it's worth noting that like the way that you described the way he plays Oriana with the ball and waiting was kind of how he thought about assassins generally also, I yeah. think. And uh, in season three, there were a lot of assassin picks that weren't necessarily super lane dominant. So I feel like this was an <coughs> era where Ryu was really comfortable, but they were assassin picks like Kha'Zix that maybe got really strong level six or something. And so he might get bullied in lane and then he would look for openings later and be effective on Kha'Zix. Um, Zed, obviously they could play a lot because Zed, they could flex early spring with with the insect and stuff. So, um, 
but so he would get more good lane matchups with Zed, I think, when he played Zed than he would on every champion. But a lot of t lanes I would watch, it would be very telling where he was okay with giving up pressure mid, you know, and then going to a side lane once he hit six or something like this. Yeah, he harkens back to an era where the mid's job was basically just delete the ADC as fast as you can. And he's still looking for those types of openings no matter what champion he's playing. So like Victor was always going to be a more successful champion for him than Azir, for example. But on the flip side, he was probably one of the best mids in Europe uh, while he was here at finding flank opportunities with his champions. Like he's the type of player who could transition very easily into being like a really strong echo player right now, for example, mid lane. Okay. <laughs> So here's a question I have then, is the one of the elements that, when we referenced this on the, some of the Insight episode you did when we were talking about H2K, that has actually been infamous about Prolly's coach, coaching career, is that he apparently, at least publicly, states that, you know, if it is a big pressure game, he kind of does cede some level of the champion pick to the oh, player. Yeah. It's a comfort pick. They can go for it. And famously, the example he gave was when Ryu picked Oriana. Uh, no, it was LeBlanc, actually, yes. And obviously, there have been a few instances like this because actually, H2K and Ryu have lost a gangload of game fives in their careers. Now, it was obviously different when you lose in Korea because you can literally choose any champion that you want as a comfort champion because you play blind pick back then. But in Europe, obviously, it's still within the compass of what you're supposedly doing, right? Was that exaggerated? Did, did he just kind of get, was he a very vocal player in terms of what he wants in, in, in like a big pressure game like that? Okay, it's funny because on the game five note, uh, when uh, I won with Shulk against Mysterious Monkeys in the game five, that was the first mm -hmm. game five in my entire career I'd won because I'd been through so many of those with H2K and we never won You didn't, you didn't have Yankos and Prolly with you, so you'd successfully purged <laughs> the temple yes. of the demons. Thank God. Yeah. So. Yes, um, but yeah, Ryu would, oh god, so the LeBlanc one specifically, I even remember very distinctly, there was a completely different champion that we had in mind for that specific situation. Okay, we legit had Karthus in mind and we all agreed backstage that we would do Karthus okay. if enemy picks like a multiple tank composition, a full on team fight composition like they had been doing, uh, like they had been doing for a lot of the series, right? And then... We get to the final pick, and I was watching this with Peke, actually. I was just like, oh my god, we're gonna do, we're gonna do the pick, you know? And then it's LeBlanc, and my face, like, just drops so significantly when that happened that I really hate remembering that. But, um, Ryu did have a lot of say when it came to, like, his specific matchup, for example. So, like, me and Polly would discuss, like, a, a priority on Azir, for example. Like, there was going to be a different priority on Azir in that specific Origin series as well. And we just asked uh, Ryu, because we, we figured that if uh, Origin played, like, the 1-1-3 one, one, uh, one, one, with Azir, that that actually really heavily benefits us. Because we do so well uh, when we're matching them on side lanes like that. And when they when they force themselves into a position where they have to match us on sides like that, and it would just be given and it's two dogs to paraphrase <coughs> everything uh, back okay. in the day. And then we asked Ryu, and Ryu just simply said that he doesn't want to play against Azir. And that was it. Ryu's word was law. So so now we're not going to go with that plan. We will just ban out Azir. You know? Think... So Ryu had a lot of say when it came to his specific matchups. Mm -hmm. It's not just Ryu. Probably did give a lot of other people sure. say in specific yes. matchups, but Ryu had a lot of veto power without having to necessarily explain himself. The way that Prolly explained it to me was that he was more willing to just go with Ryu's gut on things because he himself yeah. was a mid laner and so he would understand like being in this particular position um, what you would have to do in this situation. So in his mind, like the LeBlanc matchup in particular was really risky and really difficult to play, but he knew that Ryu knew that. And because Ryu knew that he would trust Ryu when Ryu said that this is the matchup he wanted. Um, Those triple tanks, one of which was a poppy and it seemed like a suicide situation to do on LeBlanc. Yeah. Ryu. I also feel like if you guys had played the cart, this it wouldn't necessarily have worked out because I feel like at that tournament, H2K didn't really understand the importance of mid pressure. And that was one of Ryu's biggest problems overall. Because that was like when it started being really important in Europe, and that's why G two did really well. Um, that's what. But yeah, sure, I'd agree with that.
Because that's something I wonder <coughs> about as a person, actually. Because I have to say, even though in general, I am someone who is actually a heavy believer in the concept of like having comfort champs, you know, because I notice, first of all, as a general trend, the only people who pick their comfort champs when they're like terrible are people who just have no champ pool anyway, like West Thor in some era when he can't play any assassins, right? That's the only extreme circumstance where I notice people always fuck up. In general, if they pick it, but it's not like in vogue at the moment, usually they have a logic behind it. Like, you know, I know this champion so well, I know it can do this one thing that other people don't know, or this one matchup actually it does well at a certain point if I can survive there and somehow you know there's like a there's a logic to it usually I think so normally I'm in favor of letting people do that but I have to say yeah. from watching a lot of game fives especially in the Korean region especially when they had the blind pick era I have to say as a general rule I would go against the logic that you'd use the comfort champions there because actually I've noticed in those game fives because it's like a different level of pressure I actually feel like that's exactly where you're actually better off just picking something that fits the comp or is OP mm -hmm. because you a lot of people People play very nervous in those games. They don't make a lot of like the small wins you need to kind of build up to. A, they just kind of play, and basically, like it usually comes down to, like one big mistake from someone. So in those scenarios, I'd rather sort of stack the deck and just get the most OP shit you can. Because I noticed <laughs> historically the teams that yeah. just went with the comfort pick tended to it didn't tend to work out as well as they thought. I noticed. So well, uh, is that a deficiency as a player then that he always kind of went back to that? That he always went back to comfort picks. Yeah, it seems just um, seems like it is a trend for him. Uh, it is a. I mean, for Ryu, it's more noticeable because he wasn't really in meta, uh, specifically at the time of the LeBlanc one. Like he always wants to go back to his assassin era, and that hasn't been a proper meta since like end of season four. So I think it's just more noticeable for Ryu. Every player wants to go into their comfort picks. Even like uh, even SKT went into their comfort picks. They sp they cited that as the reason why they lost to EDG. Uh, in that okay. game five at MSI. Like, I don't necessarily think this is just a Ryu specific deficiency, so to speak. I think the reason it's problematic is because of his deficiencies with his champ pool overall, rather than just wanting to go to a comfort pick game five. Because probably can veto it, and Ryu would go along with it. In my head, there's no way Ryu wouldn't go along with it, but probably really valued his comfort. I think to an extent also what really set the tone for that was the very first like spring H2K LCS third place match that they had where Ryu picked Cassidy. Um, oh, wait, it was Fnatic, right? Uh, no, this was, was against Fnatic, SK right? Gaming, right? This was the 2015 yeah, spring third place oh, match. Oh, 2015, right. Apologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, which was H2K and probably, and this was the first LCS playoffs that they had together. And oh, okay. like yeah. the Cassidy worked out and they beat SK. And I think to an extent that set a tone for their relationship. Uh, that, that would be my guess because that's I mean, also, it also the helped banning that... out all of the Forgiven's champions. Well, that might have also played as something <laughs> yeah, of a role. That's... In, in no, they the were favorites. losing when they did that. They were losing when they did that. They won when they stopped trying to do that. Okay. Yeah, that was a series also that probably points to. Like when when you bring it up, he says, I trust for you. And then he'll say, for example, this happened and like the Cassadin was effective and I didn't think the yeah. Cassadin was good, but he said he needed it. And sometimes when you're in a game five and morale is bad, okay. you just need to pick a player you think rely on a player you think can carry because the team might not necessarily be able to execute what you've wanted them to execute. And he said that's it's more of a feeling on his part that the game even gets there, not the decision that he makes in the game five itself is what he said. No, I think you're right, actually, Veteran. What yeah. I remember, though, is I think all they did is they originally were banning all of the champs out. Like, yes, they were. Like, unicorns, yeah. but, but then I think they swapped one ban to, like, Lee Sin from Svenskeren, and I think that was, like, the killer. I, I mean, well, what they did was they started opening ADs, and they were like, okay, we'll give, we'll end up giving Forgiven a winning AD no matter what, so we can open ADs, we can target their mid-jungle, and then we can go to Sivir every single time on Hyanan and Ryu can play yes. an Assassin, and we will simply force when Forgiven catches a side wave. That was that was basically the, the change okay. in strategy they had. They couldn't do that before, because Sivir is actually one of the Forgiven champions as well, mm -hmm. and... Uh, it, yeah, so so they they were they were basically screwing themselves over from the optimal draft that they won. It was actually it's actually a bait going against Forgiven. Like, uh, if for example, Flash Wolves was it Flash Wolves that they played against yes, in the IAM was the first back in the day? Yeah. The killer ban was Lulu. The killer ban was Lulu. It wasn't the AD bans. Like the AD bans were comfort things, sure, uh, but the Lulu ban was what really killed it because Lulu was a great disengage versus all of the forcing. So it wasn't just that it was so good for Forgiven in lane, but it was so difficult to engage as Forgiven's getting himself as powerful as he can get. You know, this was a team that wanted to play like the full on split style that we ended up playing on H2K far more successfully, you know, and if if they're able to do that with a really strong disengage in the 1v1, then uh, then you're you're not going to be able to break this and banning out the Lulu was the real killer there. 
and then making sure that they had Sivir and an assassin so that they could just burst someone down and immediately take the fight uh, mid while SK are doing their whole split pressure style. Uh, that was the killer in the HK series. That was the big adaptation. Going to ban out Forgiven's champ is a huge meme and a huge bait. And if you want to be forgiven, never do that. Okay. So when Ryu went over to NA and was playing in Phoenix 1, sure. one of the worst fucking names for a team ever, does... Like, obviously, in the first split, they did all right. I mean, people, yep. no, they did really well. Like, yeah, come on, calm down. But I, I, I always was like, well, uh, let me set the timer, right? How long is this going to take to fall off a cliff? So, obviously, it did in the next split. What do you actually make of Rio in North America? Because remember, like, people do it every time with every player. The logic always is like, haha, if a really good player joins NALCS, he will tear it up. And it's like, when has that ever happened, mate? Like, three times ever? Like, you know, it just doesn't happen. So, what do you make of Ryu on Phoenix One? I think the thing about Ryu on Phoenix One and why Phoenix, he was successful for, like, I guess, successful to a point in the first place is because you could play a lot of 131. And I remember the reason why Phoenix One almost had this, like, amazing. Uh, I think it was the quarterfinal. Yeah, it was the quarterfinal where they just stomped was because that was when Gunblade LeBlanc, s people started figuring out you could build Gunblade on LeBlanc and then like LeBlanc wasn't dead anymore and LeBlanc could scale really well actually with this item. And so he just completely kind of dominated that. And Phoenix One were one of the only teams within the NALCS context that were playing 131 at the time. And that also suits Ryu, where he can go to a side lane, he can sort of move in and out of the lane and look for picks and opportunities like that. He can ward the blue buff and go and, and try to kill the enemy jungler there. And this type of style where he's looking to get a pick off and transition for an objective has always been something that suits Ryu the best. And so when you're playing 131 in a meta where I swear I watched this FlyQuest versus TSM game and the bottom, it was a 51 minute game where both of the inhibitors were taken out and the bottom T1 first tier turret on blue side was still up at the end of the game. And I felt like, Jesus, how is this happening? And then, but like, that's how P1 were so effective is because they could use side lanes well and as the meta advanced we got into a situation where okay what's effective now is you're playing like these tanks and so grouping mid is much more useful and maybe if you leave the bottom t1 up it doesn't really matter because if you're going to side lanes you're going to get your mid lane forced on anyway and so reuse style stop being as effective and then also his side lane started doing poorly in lane for other unrelated reasons which is another issue that we've already brought up with ryu and i think that's kind of where phoenix one fell apart and i did talk to him when he was at rift rivals and p1 had like their brief upswing and they beat imt before they came to rift rivals and then they were beating the eu teams at rift rivals and he said like he kind of avoided the issue he said well for me, it's like I've played for a while, and so maybe if the team isn't doing well around me, I, I have some, like, it sometimes feels like a morale issue. But I don't know if that's why it is. I do think, like, he, obviously in one three one comps, you're usually picking strong lanes anyway, and so that all just works well for him. Like, you're checking the box where you have strong side lanes, you have one three ones, and you're getting picks, so. Let's remember where you did try to retire like he did actually try to retire in summer and the org basically pulled him back in and i hear that he really didn't like any of that so i'm really i i'm tempted to put a lot on mentality uh in sure. this split what i'm not going to put on mentality i'm going to put on the jungle change Ryu is not the type of person to enjoy playing with like a more rookie jungler uh for example uh the side lane collapse yeah that that's going to be a big factor that I've already said, so it's not really something to focus on and repeat again. I thought it was interesting, though, that uh, his best-performing champion was Corky. That's not the type of champion that I would typically expect Ryu to do well on, but if he's having to basically team fight his team to victory, then uh, that's a stark difference. From you the, can the flank on Corky. Like. That's true. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna pick if you're gonna pick one of these AD mid champions, you're picking he's picking the one with the most burst. So there's that. Um, but I would I would put a lot of it down to mentality. I think he I think he's basically done with his career at this point. That's the he only other thing I can add. Otherwise, I, I mostly agree with what you said. He also said he hates playing Corky. When I asked him about it at Rift Rivals too, and that his team wanted him to play Corky, and that's probably why. So, was actually Ryu 
what do you think he was like as a teammate veteran? Like, for example, is he someone who was at all rattled by having forgiven on his team? No. Uh, actually, when we ended up having the meeting uh, about being forgiven back in, uh, because Freeze couldn't play anymore. Ryu was the first to say uh, that he wanted uh, Forgiven back in. Uh, I believe the exact words that he said was, um, oh yeah, he, so he was asked to elaborate, and, and he just said, he's just right. And then and no one knew what that meant. And probably just had to poke him a bit more for more, and he's like, he doesn't talk much, but when he says he's just right, and that was like, he was the first person to come out like, in the favor of uh, of forgiven in that conversation, um, so he definitely wasn't rattled by him at all. Uh, he had a really good like a uh, rapport with Yankos and Vander. Yankos and Vander are a lot of fun uh, behind the scenes, uh, and they play around with Ryu a lot. And they the whole meme about Ryu being like a mafia boss and stuff. Like yeah. they they basically memes that to it shit. Was their tweets a lot? I noticed. Yeah, they they meme that to shit, and Ryu would just like sit there with a grin on his face basically the whole time and then he would just be like coffee or Weren't something like that the and that had to make him coffee didn't they also keep doing some lame shit like every time he left the room they kept like opening the like faker 1v1 outplay like video on the computer. <laughs> so when they came back it was just open it like fucking hell. yeah that <laughs> happened a few times yeah yeah, yeah. that's the thing I've... That's was like a really nice teammate but you could tell that he was like homesick in a way oh, okay. uh, like he really did he he liked going back to Korea when he was forced to for a visa. I'm pretty sure, and he always had like he had a care package from his parents. Uh, I assume it was his parents uh, all the time, uh, coming in with loads of Korean food and stuff. Sure. He really enjoyed it when we were boot camping in Korea. But he he was overall like a really nice teammate. He doesn't speak much English. He doesn't hold any conversations. So I can't I can't really say that he's I can't really say much more than he was a very nice teammate and he was a very nice person to be around. Okay, he was so not, You'd go and get drinks with So them. here's a topic to talk about then now, Kao. So since this is someone who once upon a time was in a very good Korean team and for a solid period of time was one of the better players in Korea, like I said, thought of as a shot caller, considered like an integral part of his team, it's actually pretty obvious to me and knowing things I know behind the scenes that during the European phase of his career, that was like the last chance saloon. Literally no one in Korea wanted him because like most Koreans I know, it goes like this. Either they want to go to NA for a lot of money. I mean, now it's not as big a difference, but it used to be a massive difference before when you used to get paid pennies to play for like fucking MVP or something. Or they want to be in the best Korean team. So you either want money or you want the chance of success, right? When he left Korea, the sense in the scene was, actually a lot of Koreans thought he wouldn't even get picked up by a European team. You know, that's why it was was the millennials of the world, the Rockats who were inquiring at the time. Hitchhiker obviously wasn't a top team at the time. Had he have stayed in Korea or been able to go back to Korea, let's say during a period in like season six, obviously he improved his level, he, the results are there, you go into Worlds. What what do you think he would be like if he stayed on a Korean team? What, like would would he actually have still been a good player in Korea? No. Uh, I assume she was going to answer. Um, but uh, um, well, I mean, you started, so go for it. I mean, you've said it. I've said it. He said it. Um, Ryu has massive temple issues. I imagine that that's the first thing that Korean teams are thinking when they're looking at him. It's a similar reason why you don't see Dade being picked up anymore and why Dade had to prove himself a lot in China that he can actually adapt to metas because that's the first big issue with Dade. Uh, and it's a huge issue with Ryu as well. And it's not something that he was fixing in Europe. He did get offers from China. He almost took an offer from China. Uh, but he we basically ended up dead set on going to NA. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that was always going to prevent him from going back to Korea. Okay. I I think if he went back to... Part of the reason why his stock fell so rapidly when he was in Korea also is because the last role he played in was jungle. And I think it's hard to sort of swap back and forth in there. And so at that point, you know, you have to go back mid because obviously he was a mid laner. He never seemed comfortable in the jungle. Like if you watched the jungle games that season, there weren't many of them, but he seemed like he was never, he re never really seemed to be on the right side of the map. Um, he lost a lot of situations where like they tried to coordinate dives in mid lane, like Insect always loved that Wraith camp. Like when they were on blue side, he always loved the enemy Wraith camp and then diving the turret from there. And he tried to set up set up dives from there like insected and they never seemed to work as well right so i think that that was a, an issue for you as well is that okay he swapped to jungle 
because his team needed him to. And then after that, he would have to find some way to prove himself as a mid laner as well. And his champion pool was probably outdated at that point to an extent. And he couldn't necessarily, because like you had the six men and everything else coming out at the end of season four, and he couldn't necessarily adapt to that quickly. So his option was to try for a foreign team probably. And that was it. Okay. So I'm a big believer in the idea that like, Yes, if we're adding every factor that a great player can have, longevity is a good one, but I definitely don't think alone that it can like supersede the other factors. Like I hate people who think that like, say you did a top 10 NA players of all time, like Dyrus would have to be in the top whatever three. Definitely not, no. In, under no circumstances. I don't care if the other people played half as long or didn't win as many titles. For, for obvious reasons, half of that longevity doesn't count towards being a great player because you were not a great player for half of that period of time, you know. So in that sense, Ryu looks like someone who's had a very long career who's had a, and had differing levels of success, but within each region has been in, at times, elite teams. Do you think he actually counts as an all-time great player? You have a fascinating relationship with TSM's top laners, don't you? I think I don't think Ryu would be. I in actually the... liked that one. To be fair, he, he wasn't like that one. Yeah, he he knew he was the bitch, and he didn't pretend he was the star. Still came at me though. They all come to me on Twitter. So, listen, Dyrus absolutely understood he was the bitch. I think we're all. I don't know why that's a surprise to you. This will be the comments in. This will be the don't, comments. Don't care, man. Yeah, he no, was say, never oh, allowed. Like, like the meme was always he was never allowed to play League of Legends, right? No, don't worry. Um, this is how TSM fans will be like. Literally ninety percent of it was just about TSM. It's like, in order, of course, you know. Well, like, we you for an hour, dive us for like one minute, it's over. Yeah. Um, I, I guess think there was been, like in like contention to bring it back to the topic at hand. Sure. As much as we'd like to bring it, make it dive episode. Uh, I don't think we will ever be like in contention for like the best, uh, the best of all time or something because he was only looking to be like people now debate whether he was like top three or top five in Korea in the season when he was at his peak. Like, okay. he's not going to be in the running for, like, top five of all time. Uh, no I, offense to me. I think that it's almost a little bit sad because I feel like he is kind of trapped in time, right? He's trapped in that time when he was really good and when he was very successful. Like, I would say he was probably top three at that time. And uh, especially, like, he could make things work really well. He could... He had a sense for when someone was going to be in a sideline and he could get that assassination attempt. And everyone remembers when High played Zed that way and was like trying to weave in and out of the sideline and and split push and backdoor. And he gave up minions to do so. But Ryu was very good at that that sort of style as well. Um, in 2006, not 2016, 2013. Um, so I think to an extent, like he was always sort of looking for that opening. And he was really good at like trying to be creative in lane i wouldn't say he's necessarily a good brute force laner but he was all about like that fort pot era um all of the, that type of thing where you could kind of find like a creative way into lane where you could call the jungle and you could flank from the side and and get a kill on the enemy mid laner that way to get back into the game if you fall behind in lane so uh i for me like i think ryu is a creative and an interesting player but he definitely focused too much on the time of the game where that mattered and i think he was kind of in a way set in his ways and i don't know how much this is exaggerated but when i when you hear about the way probably and ryu would have an exchange and probably would say like to do something and ryu would just say why or ryu would just say no <laughs> and like in a way it felt like probably didn't necessarily force him out of his comfort zone enough and Maybe that's a Ryu thing. Maybe that's an H2K thing. I'm not really sure what the different, like, uh, or maybe it's just a complete play up of how the conversations went with no, Prolly. I, I don't, I don't recall any instance where Ryu just said no uh, to Prolly, to be honest. Sure. I, I mean, there is an interview from the broadcast from 2015 where he said that this was an exchange and they said, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, no, that's definitely played up. Like the the closest sure. to no would just be like Ryu asking if he's comfortable playing against Azir, and he would say no. And uh, the why, like yeah, Ryu would ask why, but probably always had an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. So no, that 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 aspect of the relationship with probably definitely being played up. Um, I also don't agree that uh, Ryu and Hai were as similar as you're trying to paint. I'm not I saying 
Hai will either collapse or he'll push for his motherfucking life and at bare minimum bounce that <laughs> wave. There Ryu was... will like push it close to turret and then vanish into tribush for like 50 minutes or something. There was, I'm even she, she wondering why this very, wave is never coming back. I'm specifically like, referring to a game. game where you yeah. played against Najim White Shield and they all or, had one, but they it was, um, it was Samsung Blue. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Maybe it was, yes. It yeah, was where he was playing Zed and he was like trying to sneak away. She just back means doing like a gimmick play, basically. Like, I was, trying to relate, I was trying to relate. I just heard 2013 and I was like, what? But yeah. I was uh, trying to relate Ryu to um, like something that Western <coughs> fans would be familiar with, like 2013 Ryu to like something that I did in a game in 2014 Worlds. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I think I mean, that I will game say... is actually pretty famous, so. Like, I, mm -hmm. I will say on that topic of, like, how you kind of gauge all-time great players who win it elsewhere, mm -hmm. as harsh as this sounds, I do think if you were ever really good in Korea, even if it was just for a year or two years, I think that actually already does, like, 90% of your boost up the ladder. Like, that alone, in my opinion, can make you an all-time great player. So, like, the idea that, like, for example, like, Dandy isn't good because he went to China, like, fuck off. Like, he was so good for two years, it doesn't even matter. Like, yeah, he's I would still say... Good China. <laughs> he was still pretty good, yeah. He just didn't have a team, obviously. I would just go ahead and say for Ryu, like, first of all, in season three, he was a fucking stud. I do think he was very good then, especially because as someone who was a very in-depth viewer of Blaze games, at that point in time, Blaze used to completely <laughs> ride having flame and ambition. And ambition was actually still a very good player in season three. So there was only a couple of people could actually like outright beat ambition as a mid lane, and he was one of the few ones. And that's why they would always lose these epic series to Katie Bolt. So I will say season three, I thought he was a stud. Season four, he clearly had his issues. Like I think the entire team was collapsing, but he was one yeah. of the main reasons why for sure. And then like season five, the problem is when he was on H2K, the, like the first one, like it just wasn't that great a team. So he was clearly one of the better parts of the team. But like they were one of those teams that would make like the semis. And in no universe did I ever think they were winning LCS. You know, they weren't like that sort of a team. They were just like oh, I they thought they were like one oh, spring. No, they couldn't. They were like overachievers, mate. They did Once... very well. No, okay. If they hadn't, okay. If they had just pulled back from mid in the fourth Fnatic game okay. that they got to in semis, they would have won that game. And then they would have beaten they unicorns. Hands they could have lost down. to unicorns a lot. Don't worry, mate. They could have done. I mean, that. Fnatic so close to winning. Fnatic spent thing. spent like two games on like the Huni strategy, Huni Lee Sin yeah, strategy. Sure. So, <laughs> it was, so it was definitely, definitely possible for each. By the way, that is probably the weakest LCS split of all time. Bearing in mind, <laughs> SK just collapsed completely. So that is probably the shittest LCS split. Then you look at season six. Okay, season six was pretty good, but the problem there is his whole team is just too good. Like, almost everyone on that team, legitimate. Like, that's one of the few teams I think you could legitimately have done the whole, like, thing they do every season in NA, where every single player on the best team is, like, all LCS. That's one of the only seasons I, where I think, like, maybe you could say Vander had some issues because it was his first split, but, like, come on, man. Oh, that team was fucking banging. And I, admittedly, Vander maybe they had issues as a team. But top three. It was still pretty good. Yeah, so I'll say the problem there is he looked even better in that season, but, come on, this whole team was better, wasn't he? So... Mm -hmm. I, I have a problem with Koreans and people like that. Like, I think if you go to the West, you sort of do have to just dominate to, to add to your legacy from before, you know? Otherwise, anyone can stretch the career out like six years or something, you know? Yeah. I also think that there it's there's this weird, almost untouchability that comes with like having had a really, really, really good year sure. in Korea, right? And then you go to West and people who are kind of like casual viewers of the game will say, well, the team was just shit now, wasn't it? And that's like, that's the way it is because once you've achieved a level, and I think it's fair, like if you've achieved a level of immortality, like you should have some legendary status you get more leeway, att sure, yeah. attributed to you, but I, I don't think it's fair to just like then blame the entire rest of the team and say, yes, but he was good while he's like failing every trade in lane or something yeah. like this. So. Cause you know, I actually also think just as a side topic, cause I think it fits Ryu's career. I actually think if you look, there are actually very few instances of Korean teams being wrong when they cut these guys and no one ref no one's willing to pick them up nearly all of those instances that guy like either's on his last legs or, or he has to go to a weaker region to be viable on <laughs> like one of the things koreans are amazing at and this is one of the reasons why i get tilted by narratives is koreans do not sit back with the same roster and just believe and hold hands and pray and believe in friendship and think people are going to improve year on year koreans are ruthless as fuck they'll just get you out there and get a brand new guy out of solo queue who hasn't yet failed and say oh he's got all this upside let's try him out and that's that's why they'll do that because 
they know to improve, you have to make these big changes. That's why I get so tilted by the Western narratives of like, well, we did badly at Worlds this year, but this is our first year. So next year when we go back, we'll do better. It's like, that's that's never happened. That that quality has never been required of any team that was really good at Worlds ever. <laughs> that you're just good immediately, you know? Because at the end of the day, if your team is shit, you don't, you don't take, like, I'll put it simply like this. You do... In every team game, you don't take shit teams and polish them up to good teams. You chop away the parts that are shit and you put in good parts that work. And good teams work within months, you know. You don't have to wait three years to get really good. I, I agree with you to an extent, but I think there are a few issues why that doesn't, like, work one-to-one -one in the West. One is that uh, I think it takes a lot, Western teams, a lot longer as a unit to learn team play elements. Okay. Um, they seem to struggle with that to an extent, and then you'll you'll see like smart or creative junglers, for example, like Maxlor. Every team that he's been on for the past couple of years, it's it's taken like at least three, four, five weeks before this team has the upswing that they inev inevitably do with him on the roster. And I think a lot of it comes down to when you're a jungler, you have to kind of learn what your lanes want, um, what 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 this particular laner needs like maybe this lane wants you to gank all the time maybe this lane is just fine if you put a ward or something like this so um to an extent i think that there is some element there that for some reason takes longer on western things i think it, it teams it might be support staff related it might be player related i'm not really sure what it's what it's related to but it does seem to take a little bit longer um and then the other aspect is that like it also seems to take longer to teach young players in the West and people are also really bad at identifying which young players are going to be good. Like some teams are just picking up really, really bad prospects in general. So like the threat doesn't seem as effective. It's like if you're poor this split, then it's like, oh, this guy is mediocre and we at least know he's mediocre, right? So we're not sure. Um, whether or not this new guy is worth the investment. So I think that to an extent, like I understand why teams will stick with with rosters longer. Like Splice themselves said that, okay, we never actually had anything uh, uh, in a game plan besides like ganking top until the second year. And then we realized we needed something like that. So <laughs> uh, I don't know. It depends on the team, obviously, but I think in Korea there's that's been effect more effective for a variety of different reasons. I'm not sure I'd pick Splice myself as a good Splice example of team like learning. They, yeah. they, they huh? went the opposite way, if anything. Yeah, they went the opposite <laughs> way, but they went the opposite way because of some of these reasons okay. that, yeah. yeah Splice are unlike Glycosm. They're very unwilling to, to criticize each other, and that's one yes. of the reasons why they keep searching for like a, a stricter coach, I believe they said sure. in like one of your interviews. Yeah. Like They're specifically looking for that. I think that a lot of teams in the West are far less willing to take uh, risks mm -hmm. on rookies. They all view sure. it as a risk, by the way. So like, yeah. I'm surprised that half the rookies I've scouted were, were, were free at the time. Like, They really shouldn't have been there. There are a lot of players that are just much better than a lot of their counterparts. And like, people people are still criticizing Norskeren's uh, performance in like the first half of uh, the promotion tournament. Uh, but still, that guy, if he goes into an LCS team, he's already a mid-level support in the EU LCS. Supports are that difficult to come by right now, and they en you end up importing stuff like Wadded. Um, but players in general are a lot more trusting of like veteran players than they yes. are of... Uh, of rookie talent. They're much more willing to work with veteran players than they are with rookie talent. And orgs that just don't have enough knowledge will always listen to the players in, in these types of concerns. So you have teams that are a lot less willing to change. When they do change, it's for a guy who's been set in his way for the last three years or so. Yes. It's not necessarily that this type of guy is resistant to coaching. Like, Soaz is actually really easy to work with, for example. And he's like the longest standing player in, uh, in Europe and from from like his Twitter, you'd think that he's really difficult to work with. He was actually like the easiest player in Origin to work with when I was there. Um, but what you have with like these veteran types of players is that whereas they will like try the things that you say and they will work on the things you say to work as, it's just harder for them to to get out of the the muscle memory that they've developed over the last years. You know, it's not necessarily a, a resistance to change. It's it's just harder for them to do so at that point. Whereas with rookie talent, if you know what you're doing, it's much easier. Like Kajul's like a completely different player now than he was when he first joined Schalke, for example. And you wouldn't get that. Like I I, I can't I couldn't do that with Selfie, for example. Like Selfie had some deficiencies at the end that he had at the start, and those deficiencies continued in in Tempo Storm as well well and and cost them a lot like uh these you're, you're gonna have a much better time if you just end up with staff that's capable of scouting 
uh, these types of rookie talents and if you have a team that's more willing to, to take in these types of rookie talents. Uh, but if the West isn't going to start doing that, if they're just going to default to importing or staying with like the same pool of players that they have before, then they, they really can't blame anyone else if they find it harder to develop these players. It's going to be harder to develop imports. It's going to be harder to develop veteran players. It's always going to be that way. Hey, this is Travis Gafford, the Double Lift expert, and you're watching Thorne's YouTube channel.